Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hi, I'm Sean, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. And yes, we are on vacation. For our holiday, we're going to Vietnam. Never been there before, and we're hoping to just sit there, have a lot of coffee, just the Vietnam coffee, and then read and sleep and eat. And that's pretty much it. Which means that we will be running five reruns while we're away. It's nice to listen to stuff just so that you get reminded. I listen to stuff all the time. In fact, sometimes I listen to things so many times over because it doesn't necessarily sink in the first time. Or you just have to be reminded and it's a good reminder at the point that the podcast comes along. So with that spirit in mind, let's get started with this episode. One of the most fascinating quotes I've ever heard is planning is priceless, but plans are useless. And yet, that's exactly what this episode is about. Not the useless part, but the planning part, the prep part. Because as we're about to find out, it's pretty much a war out there. And the more prep you do, whether you're in a game of basketball, or writing an article, or making a movie... The prep that you do gets you ready for the chaos that follows. So yes, those plans might go crazy, but it's your preparation that keeps you a little sane. So let's get right into the episode. There's something incredibly fascinating about the way chefs work. A chef doesn't tend to cook for one person, and in one night, one single night, that chef might need to whip up anywhere between 50 to 200 meals. And we're not even necessarily talking about chefs that you see in fancy kitchens. You can walk into any food court, you can go to any roadside stall, and it's the same story. There is flavor, there's taste, there's texture, and there's this huge volume and variety in the food. And got me thinking, what makes the chef so proficient at what she or he does? The answer, strange as it seems, is that they don't tend to worry about how the dish is going to turn out. Their obsession seems to lie in the prep work, the preparation. So let's say... We're going to make you that chef. And let's say you have to make an Indian dal. And dal, if you don't know, is split pulses or legumes. And now what you have to do is you're going to need onions. You're going to need tomatoes. You're not going to need chilies, uh, ginger, garlic paste, and about five or six spices. It's at this stage that the professional and the wannabe seems to have plans that are diametrically different. Let's just take the act of chopping onions. How do you chop an onion efficiently? Here's what you do. Step one, you cut the onion from head to toe, not through the belly, but head to toe. And if you follow that first instruction, the peel, the skin comes out way faster than if you went through the belly. So that's two steps. And then the third step is you hold the onion, and this is difficult to say on audio, but you hold the onion and then you chop methodically and evenly but only three-fourths of the way. And finally, you cross-cut the onion, and you get chopped onion. Now, that's precise, and and the onion cooks really evenly. But if we were to jump from onion cutting to article writing, we have the same amount of preparation, or at least a similar amount of preparation. A wannabe writer will start to look far into the future, towards how that article will show up, how it will be written, And that writer might spend hours wondering how to start the article. 
But this is not what professionals tend to do. Professional writers head right into the zone of prep work. They know that it's the preparation. It's the onions, the tomatoes, the spices. That's the part of the writing that really matters. So they work on getting topics together. Then they realize the topics are too broad. And so they have to go into the subtopic or the sub-subtopics. And when they finish that phase of preparation, they go to the next one, which is outlining. Some scribble outlines in a matter of minutes and some take more time to get more explicit with their detail. But all of this is still the preparation stage. But let's say we shift our focus back to the wannabe writer. What is he or she trying to do at this point in time? They're trying to do triple somersaults about what's down the road. They're eager to get past all of this nonsensical planning, this outlining of topics and other blah, blah, blah stuff that comes along the way. So all of this prep work for the wannabe writer is somehow an obstacle. And the sooner they get over it all, the more likely they feel, okay, I will get to the finished work. But a professional will tell you that the end point tends to be the most straightforward bit. All of the energy goes into the prep work. And this brings us to a very critical point. All of this prep work, it's truly exhausting. Writing an outline can take anywhere between 30 to 40 minutes. That's on top of the time that you take for the subtopics and the topics and all of that idea generation. And that's not counting the story that you're going to need for the first 50 words to start up your article. All of this prep work is truly frustrating at the best of times, which is why the pros always focus on reducing the energy needed for the prep work. What this means is that prep work, cutting onions, doing all that stuff, it takes an enormous amount of time. So if it takes you 20 minutes to cut an onion, and now you can get it down to 10 minutes, or you can get it down to 5 minutes, or get it down to 3 minutes, now what you've done is reduce the amount of energy that's needed to do the prep work. And that is phenomenal. So someone writing an outline will go from 60 minutes to 30 minutes, from 30 minutes to 20 minutes, from 20 to 10, and possibly even just a few minutes. I just tend to whip out a Evernote file and just make some notes, or I'll just write something on my iPad, or I'll have a post-it. The point is, now I can do that in a few minutes, and it's all prep work. But also notice the subtle message here, which is the energy required for the prep work needs to come down. Because when you work on getting stunningly fast at the preparation stages, the end product almost takes care of itself. If you want to find someone who struggles with their writing, who struggles with their drawing, their cooking, or just about any skill, Look at what they're doing in the preparatory stages. They're slow. They're inefficient. They may still turn out a great product. There is no doubt about that. But it's mind-numbingly energy-dependent. And by the time they're done with their project, they have to rest. They have to take long breaks. And they dread starting up another project of a similar nature. I was that person. If you look at my drawing today, you'll think that I always drew this way. I was always good at cartooning. And the thing with cartoons is that it leaves a trail. You can go back in time and see the cartoons that I've done. And even if you don't consider yourself much of a critic, you'll see giant strides all of a sudden. So if you go back to the year 2000, I was already a good cartoonist. But if you look at the work today, it's remarkably superior. And one of the obvious thoughts that come to our head is, well, this is all practice. You practice, you practice, you get better. But you fail to see the prep work. Because when I look at my work today, I put in more prep work than ever before. So if you look at the photos album in my iPad, there are over 800 images there. Just like ingredients. Just images of different things. And that's one stage of the prep work. When... I'm drawing, I'll have sketches. Several of them will be stages in progress. 
and they'll all be waiting to see the light of day. And then I'll run some of these ideas past my wife, Ranuka, and, you know, she'll say, oh, that's horrible. And I'll keep it aside and it'll sit there sometimes for weeks. And then one day that same idea shows up in a different way. So all of this is prep work. And all the time I'm trying to make this system, all of this prep work more efficient. Yet when I look at other artists, what they tend to do is, okay, I have to draw and I'm going to draw right now. And that's where the trouble begins. Now I've been talking about drawing, but it applies to anything. It applies to cooking as well. So I cook a new dish for every meal. And unlike in the past, our fridge never seems to have leftovers because we cook and then we eat. The process of the prep work has become so energy efficient that having stale and reheated food makes no sense at all. If I do the prep work, then the cooking part, that's five to seven minutes. So we're going to have fresh meals all the time. And it's taken years to understand what makes some people so incredibly productive. And if we are paying attention, you and I, we'll both come to the same conclusion. It's an unmistakable conclusion. The prep work needs to be ruthlessly efficient. It's not just prep work, but it needs to be efficient. And if we go back to the article writing course, in the article writing course, the client has to learn about topics, subtopics, outlines, first 50 words. And yes, as a teacher, I'm looking at the assignment every day, sometimes, not sometimes, all the time, several times a day. But here's the thing that I look for the most. I look at the daily log of the participants. I want them to note down how long they took to do the assignment. I want to see how much time they spent on learning. I am more interested in their state of mind, in the time they take, what they are dreading. That's the kind of stuff that I'm interested in. All of this information is in the daily log that they are supposed to do when they given their assignment. And it paints the detail of the prep work. It paints how efficient they are at the prep work. This isn't to suggest that the end isn't important. Having a goal, even a hazy idea of where you're headed, that's definitely the way to go. However, it's very easy to place all your attention on the end point and forget that it's the tiny components that it's the prep work. That's what makes the journey more fun instead of this dread and this drudgery. To finish, let me tell you a story about John Wooden. You may have never heard of John Wooden, but he was a coach and an excellent basketball coach. In the space of 12 seasons, he won 10 championships with UCLA, and that put him in an orbit all by itself. But Wooden had a very strange way of starting his coaching system. At the start of every season, he taught every basketball player to tie their shoelaces. Shoelaces? Surely there were better things to learn than tying shoelaces. But Wooden did it every year. And he had a reason why he went through this seemingly mindless routine. Badly tied laces lead to blisters, he would say, and well-tied laces means that you don't easily get sprained ankles. You notice something? Wooden wasn't focused on the final score. Yes, the final score mattered, but he wasn't focused on it. Instead, it was the prep work that mattered. When you take care of the prep work and you become incredibly speedy at it, extremely efficient at it, you use up so little energy. And when you use up little energy, then you can go on to the main body of work that you've been looking for, and then you have the energy for that. So it's the prep work and reducing that amount of time that's important. Now that brings us to the end of this podcast. And if you noticed, there were no three parts here. There was just one part. And it was just an in-between, as I like to call it. And there's not a lot to summarize, but if you can look at your prep work, like cutting an onion, and you can say, well, it takes me 10 minutes to do that, 
I'll get it down to eight and seven and six. All of that makes all the difference when you're writing, when you're drawing, when you're to, trying to learn any skill. If you can reduce the amount of prep work time, that's the most crucial thing of all. So that brings us to the end of this podcast. Let's find out what's happening in Psychotactics land. We are not far from the end of the year, and we've got September, October, and November to go. And there are three products that you can get, which are home study, self-study. So the first one is the uniqueness course. The second one is the article writing course, which many people want. And finally, the pre-sell course, which helps you sell products. So the uniqueness course is on the 20th of September, the article writing course on the 11th of October, and the pre-sell on the 22nd of November. Now, you have to be on the waiting list, so you have to go to psychotactics.com slash ugoodies or psychotactics.com slash awgoodies, and that's how you get on the waiting list. You also get some goodies, as you would expect. And that's pretty much it from Psychotactics Land. Bye for now. Still listening? We do a lot of prep work, as you'd expect. There are podcasts to be done, posts to be sent out, all of that stuff. And one of the crucial elements of that planning is re-entry. And I've talked about this before, but we not only have to plan for when we're away, but also when we get back. So a lot of the podcasts, a lot of the newsletters, all of that stuff has been put in place for a whole month when we get back. And that gives us a softer re-entry. And yes, planning is priceless and plans may seem to be useless. But what we found is most of the time, they seem to work. I'll say bye for now and see you in 5000 BC. Bye-bye.